Father, we come to you this morning, this Lord's Day. We just thank you to, we can once again come and worship you. We thank you, Lord, for each and every one that's here and those that are listening. We ask you to bless them, bless your servant today, give me the words that need to be spoken. We just thank you, Lord, for the things that you do for us each and every day that we just take for granted. We, we pray, Lord, for continued safety and health for each and every one. Pray that you bless this day. We just thank you, Lord, for the freedom to be able to come here to just worship you. And Father, we just pray that you put your blessings on this nation, even though this nation does not deserve you, deserve any blessings, that it has just completely turned away from you. And Father, we just pray that you bless this service, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. This morning, the title of my sermon is Genealogies of Jesus. As we prepare to celebrate Christmas and the birth of Jesus as a man, I want to look back at the genealogies of Jesus. This is not your usual Christmas story, but my preaching is not normal. I try and bring out the neglected things in Scripture. You know, anybody who's listened to me long enough, they know that uh, I preach on a lot of things that others do not preach on or just do not want to touch or whatever. Now today, people are often using DNA to try and fight out, find out their ancestry, but in the days of Jesus, genealogies were well recorded for all to verify as who your dad was, was very important in some cases, such, some cases such as we will see with Jesus. You know, there, there's, you know, it's very important back in those days to see exactly who you were related to. And in the case of Jesus, we're going to see this was very important because he had to prove that he was from the line of David so he could have authority to that throne. At the time of the birth of Jesus, genealogy of a person was very important to the Jews as well as many other countries. So it wasn't just the Jews, you know, many other countries it was the same thing, but, you know, the Jews especially because they were looking for Messiah and, you know, they wanted this king that was supposed to be ruling for David and so forth like that and so you know it was very important now the genealogies of the Jews were well recorded and in the case of Jesus it was especially important because he claimed to be the son or descendant of King David you know he, he said he was the son of King David now we know he wasn't the literal son he was actually just descendant but that's how it was used in scriptural days now he told his disciples that one day he would reign as king from the throne of David. In order to do that, he would have to prove that he was eligible to do so. Now the genealogy of Jesus could easily be verified as to whether his claim was legitimate. You know, he, he, his, it wasn't just him, but anybody, you know, they could go to the temple or whatever and they could very easily verify these claims. Now we are given three accounts of the genealogy of Jesus in the Gospels. Most people only claim there are two counts, but I will show you there are actually three as to who Jesus is. Now the accounts vary in details, and we will see that this is important and is not an error in Scripture or a contradiction. You know, I'll mention it again, but like I said, the, it, the genealogy was very clear that you know he he could it very easily could be confirmed what he was saying. So you know, it's not one of those things that anybody could just go and claim, "Well, I'm the son of David," or you know, this or that, you know, his claim could be easily verified. So if someone said that, but it really were not, they could easily just be disproved and, you know, his whole ministry would have gone away very quickly. Now the Jews were looking for the Messiah to come and knew that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem as the descendant of David or as a son of David as they refer to him. As I said, they refer to him as the son of David, but, you know, it's not a direct son, it's really a descendant. Look at, uh, look at a couple verses here. Look at Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 5. So Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Notice that branch and king are both capitalized because they are in reference to Jesus here. That You know, that's one of his titles, his branch, and you know, of course, he will be the king of kings and lord of lords. And then go to Matthew chapter 22, verse 42. So Matthew chapter 22, verse 42. You know, in the King James Bible, 
Whenever king is capitalized, it always refers to Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is never, you know, there's only a few exceptions where it starts a sentence or a, a verse that, you know, otherwise, you know, they do not, King James Bible does not capitalize earthly kings the way modern Bibles do, which is corrupted. Now, Matthew chapter 22, verse 42, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. A son in scripture, as I said earlier, does not ne always necessarily mean a literal son, but in this case, just a descendant. You know, oftentimes they would say, you know, he's the son of so-and-so when, you know, it really was a grandson, or in this case, he's, you know, way down in the genealogy. But let's go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, and we'll, we'll kind of see this here. That, you know, that they're not literal sons, but... Just rather descendant. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, obviously, he was not, again, the literal son of David. And neither was David the literal son of Abraham, you know, or Jesus of Abraham for that matter. But, you know, they were in that line, you know, from Abraham down to David and then David down to Jesus. You know, they were descendants. But, you know, they weren't. It was not a literal son, but they would refer to him as the son. Now, to prove he was the Messiah, Jesus would have to prove that he had fulfilled all the prophecies concerning the Messiah, starting with the right to rule on the throne of David as his son. As his son. The genealogy of Jesus was never doubted that he was the son of David, as he was referred to, that, to as that, and the people wanted him to take the throne at that time and overthrow the Romans. And I already said they could easily go to the temple and verify the genealogy of Jesus, and the people did. You know, as I said, there was, you know, the Jews of Jesus' day never questioned why there were two different accounts of Jesus' genealogy, as they understood that both were legitimate. It was clear that Jesus was a son of David. Now, here are some verses showing they understood Jesus was a rightful heir of David's throne. We're going to look at a few verses, but, you know, that was, that was never in the question. You know, the people... They may not have believed that Jesus was certain things, but they, you know, God or whatever, but they never questioned that he was a legitimate son of David. So, you know, that was never in question as, as to him being a, a son of David. So let's look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 27. You know, and it's, again, since he was the son of David, they also never questioned him being able to become king, which we're going to look at here shortly, but... That's why they wanted him to become king, because they knew he had that right to that throne. So those things were never never in question. And as I said, they never questioned why were there two different genealogies that we're going to look at here. We'll look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And the people knew Jesus was the son of David as he rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday as they were hoping he was coming as king. Let's go to Matthew chapter 21 and verse 9. So Matthew chapter 21 and verse 9. You know, so again, they, they understood that he had that right to that throne and, and, and you know, he was that son of David. So you know, those things were never in, in question. You know, we, we, people try to, today try to say, well, the Bible has contradictions or it's wrong because it has these two genealogies. But they themselves of that day never questioned why Jesus had these, these different genealogies. Uh, so Matthew chapter 21, verse 9. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So we see, you know, there's a couple of times, a couple examples here where they were referring to him as the Son of David. Now, since the people understood that Jesus was a legitimate Son of David, and rightful heir to the throne, and they wanted to make him king, even if they had to force him to become king, as they wanted to remove the authority of Rome. You now, they were tired of being under Rome. They were looking for this Messiah. They were expecting him to come and rule and, and, and uh, ease their burden from the Roman Empire. But that's not what Jesus came for, to, to, to take authority from the Romans. Let's turn to John chapter 6, verse 15. So John chapter 6, verse 15. John chapter 6, verse 15. 
When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. So see, they, you know, he, they were wanting to, even if they had to forcefully make him become king. Now Jesus will one day claim the throne of David, but that will not be until his second coming when he will reign from Jerusalem for 1,000 years during the millennium. Now Jesus came the first time not to be king, even though he had that right, but rather to be the savior of mankind. So you know he had that legitimate right. He had that authority. He could have taken over as king. You know they would not even had to force him. You know, but he did not come the first time to become king. He came the first time to be the savior of all people. Whereas the second time, then yes, he will come. When he comes in the second time, he will come as king of kings. Now the first genealogy account that we will look at is found in Matthew 1. There are differences in opinion about these genealogies. Matthew 1 shows the genealogy of Jesus from David by his stepdad Joseph from David's son Solomon. Let's look at a few verses here in Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 6. So Matthew chapter 1 verse 6. And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. So we're seeing that it's going through the line of Solomon here from, from David. Then we go down to verse 16. So Matthew chapter 1 verse 16. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So if you continue down, it would go from Solomon on down to the to Jacob, who was the dad of Joseph. And then we know this it says that Joseph was the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. So we know that Jesus is the Messiah. We know that he was born of Mary, you know, who is the wife or was the wife of Joseph. Now go to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So see again, you know, it also clarifies in case people were not understanding that Joseph is a son of David. If you read the genealogy, you would see that he was, but in case you still didn't pick it up, that we are told here in verse 20 that Joseph is a son of David. So we know, and we're going to see that this is important that when it comes with Jesus, that you know Jesus has that right to that throne. Now this genealogy will show Jesus is the legitimate son of David because Joseph has taken Jesus as his adopted son, and therefore he gets all the rights of a natural son as Joseph was his legal dad. You know, that's how it worked in Jewish law. That even though he was not, Joseph was not the actual biological dad of Jesus, he had adopt, fully adopted him and had the legal, you know, all the legal rights as if he had been his natural born child belonged to Jesus. So since he was a son of David, you know, he would continue down and he would be a son of David by Joseph there. Now the only problem was Jesus was disqualified from the throne since there was a king in this line that was cursed by God who said he would never have a descendant to reign on the throne. This is where the second genealogy account will come into play later. So in theory, he had the right to the throne as that son of David, but we're going to see that he does not have that right through Joseph because there was a king in that line that was cursed so that no descendant would have one, and that would include Jesus. So we're going to see that that's where the second genealogy will come into play. Now the cursed king was Jeconiah, who was also known as Coniah and Jehoiakim, and also Jeconias in the New Testament. Now Jeremiah, like if you look there in um, Matthew or whatever, you'd see he's a Jeconias. But Jeremiah, chapter, let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 30. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 30. Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. So see, if, you look, if you're looking at Matthew, the rest of Matthew, if you went through that whole genealogy, you'd see Jeconias is in there. That's, that's, uh, you know, that's the Greek version of the word Jeconiah, which he was also referred to as Coniah and Jehoiakim in Scripture. You know, it's all one and the same person. It's got these four names, but it's all the same person. And... He had been cursed by God 
that none of his descendants would be able to rule on that throne. So therefore, Jesus, you know, through Joseph, he was a legitimate son of David, and he had that right to the throne, but he did not have that right to the throne because that line had been cursed. So <clears throat> now because of this curse, Jesus would be disqualified from the throne except for his line through Mary. You know, there are people who claim that Jesus was still not disqualified since he was not a blood descendant of Joseph and therefore was not a part of a curse. Since Joseph was the legal dad of Jesus, it is said that he is thus still eligible. It is said that Jesus could claim the throne as the legal son of Joseph because of what is known as the Liverite marriage rule where if a brother died without any children and they lived together, then the next brother was expected to marry his brother's widow and give her children. This first child would be considered as the offspring of the dead brother with any additional children as the children of the living brother. Now this was done to keep the family name alive. The first child would retain all rights of the dead brother. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 6. So Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 6. And it shall be that the firstborn which shall which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother, which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. Now others have claimed that they believe that the curse only applied to the lifetime of Jeconiah or to his son and, and did not continue on. They say this can be seen in Zerubbabel, who was the governor of Judah, upon the Jews' return following the end of the Babylonian captivity. It is believed that Zerubbabel was the grandson of Jeconiah, as mentioned in my Zechariah study. You know, we're going to look at um, a couple verses here to show that. But the thing is, uh, look, at, turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. So 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. You know, well, I'll mention it after. We, we get to this, we're going to see that, that uh, you know, part of this may be true. But the thing is, even though, you know, they said, you know, that jo uh, Jesus would still have the legitimate because he was not a blood descendant of Joseph. To me, because he had the legal rights, that would include that the legal rights would include that curse that went along with, you know, as if he had been a blood relative. I mean, that's part of that legal right is you you're considered as if you had that been a blood descendant. But look at First Chronicles chapter three, verses sixteen and seventeen. And the sons of Jehoiakim, Jeconiah his son, Zedekiah his son, and the sons of Jeconiah, Aser. Salatio, his son. I remember that Salatio. You know, so we got sons of Jeconiah, you know, there's Salatio. Then go to Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1. So Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet under Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of jo Josedek, the high priest saying, Now it is true that Zerubbabel was made governor, but this is still not the same as king, and there is no evidence that his governorship was passed down to his sons and on down the line. You know, whereas the, the, the uh, king, you know, would have gone down to his son and keep on going. Now, excuse me, others have said that Jeconiah repented during the Babylonian captivity, and thus God ended the curse. They also used the example of Zerubbabel as governor, as well as the fact that Jeconiah was elevated by the Babylonian king to no longer be in prison, but rather to eat at the king's table. Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 27 through 30. So 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 27 through 30. And it came to pass in the 7 and 30th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the seven and twentieth day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, did lift up the head of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, out of prison. And he spake kindly to him, and set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon, and changed his prison garments, and he did eat bread continually before him all the days of his life. And his allowance was a continual allowance given him of the king, a daily rate for every day all the days of his life. 
Now it is possible, I suppose, that any of these possibilities about Jeconiah are true, and that Jesus was still eligible for the throne, the throne by Joseph due to legal rights. But I believe that it was most likely from Mary that Jesus obtained those rights, and that is why we have the second genealogy account in Luke. Now Luke's account may have just been to show that Jesus is well qualified as he is qualified by both his mom and stepdad. But I think it is by Mary, which is why God told Moses to rule about women by Zelophehad's daughters, which would come into play with Mary. You know, so before you turn to uh, Luke, go to, stay there in Matthew chapter 1. I want to show one more verse that shows that, that uh, you know, appears that Zerubbabel is a descendant, you know, the grandson of uh Check the nine, you know. So we'll go to uh, chapter, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 11. Uh, so yeah, Matthew chapter 1 verse 11. And Josias begat Jeconias. Like I said, remember I said Jeconias, same as Jehoiakim, Jeconiah, Coniah, whatever. And his brethren, about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salatiel. Remember and Salatiel begat Zeror Babel. So remember that you know that Salatiel is the same as the you know they're just spelled a little bit. These are the Greek spellings, but that Zeror Babel is the same as Zerubbabel and so forth. So you know it does seem that he is probably the grandson. You know more than likely it's the same same people spoken. So you know he it, it is more than likely. But you know so those things are possible that the curse did end or whatever. But Again, there's still a difference between being a governor and a king. And, you know, granted, he did let him, you know, but there is, you know, there is the fact that, you know, he may have repented and so then God removed some of the curse or something. And the fact that, you know, he was elevated above all the other kings in captivity, you know, Scripture does not really say. But, you know, but I, I think ultimately we're going to see that it, that's why we're going to look at this second genealogy. It's, it's the line of Mary it's really important that allows him that, you know, through what we, you know, I don't want to say a loophole, but that's where, where this, this uh, law of Zelophehad's daughters is going to come into play. You know, otherwise it's kind of like, why, why was this stuff mentioned? But So the second genealogy of Jesus as a man can be found in Luke 3. This second genealogy shows Jesus as a blood descendant of David by his mom Mary, by David's son Nathan, rather than Solomon by his um, his stepdad uh, Joseph. So this genealogy leaves no doubt that Jesus has a rightful claim to the throne of David, which he will assume during the millennium. You know, we're going to see he is directly by blood through Mary, a descendant of you know a son of David. So you know he you now granted Nathan was not one of the kings, but he is still has that authority as the son of David, and then through that right, maybe through, uh, you know, Joseph or so forth, then, you know, he has the right to be the king. But look at Luke chapter 3, verse 23. Luke chapter 3, verse 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of healing. And then go to verse 31. So Luke chapter 3, verse 31 which was the son of Malia, which was the son of Menan, which was the son of Mattatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David. So verse 23 shows Jesus as the supposed son of Joseph, since he was only the adopted son of Joseph and not his biological son. You know, that's why it says the supposed son, because he was not a biological son of Joseph. So, you know, he, he was... You know, a supposed son, you know, because he'd been adopted. So he, you know, he'd taken on the rights of being a biological son, but he was not a actual blood descendant of Joseph. Now it says Joseph and not Mary, since the man was the head of the house, not the wife. And this is how genealogies were determined. There are some who say that Mary is not mentioned, since this genealogy still applies to Joseph rather than Mary, and this is seen by his name being mentioned. <clears throat> they say this genealogy shows the Leverite laws in effect, as Healy may have been the father-in-law of Joseph, was considered the adopted son of Healy. 
Now these things may be true, but I tend to believe that Luke's genealogy shows the bloodline of Jesus by Mary. You know, there again, there are different people thinking that what these two genealogies actually represent. You know, the popular ones are, are like I said, where this is one's Mary, so I want Joseph. You know, but there's others that say that that you know it says in here, um, you know, mentions you know the supposed son of David and so forth, and then it talks about Healy. Healy was actually the dad of Mary. You know, he would have been his father-in-law, father-in-law of Joseph, or Joseph would have been his son-in-law. And but yet he basically, we're going to see here that you know we'll we'll, we'll get to it in a minute, but. Um, and I believe the fact that Jesus is able to claim the throne of David by his mom Mary is the reason that God told Moses how to handle the situation with Zelophehad's daughters. Zelophehad had had five daughters but no sons. He died in the wilderness and his daughters said to Moses that they should be entitled to their dad's property or else it would be removed from the family because there were no sons. Now God agreed and told Moses that they were to get their share of land but that they had to marry men within their own tribe so that the land would stay in the tribe. You know, this way, I mean, because if they went married for, to another tribe, then it would go from the man, so then that the, the tribes would keep losing men, uh, all this land because, you know, if they just had daughters, they'd keep losing land eventually to some other tribes. So they were required to have to marry within their own tribe so that the land would stay within the tribe. Let's look at Numbers chapter 27, verses 6 through 8. So Numbers chapter 27... In verses 6 through 8. Okay, Numbers chapter 27, verses 6 through 8. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, The daughters of Zehelophad speak right. Thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren. And thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then he shall cause his inheritance to pass under his daughter. You know, and of course, if you read on, you would see that they ended up marrying people within their tribe, you know, some sons within their tribe. You know, they were all brothers, and so, you know, they did just as God commanded. Now, by God allowing this exception, this would then later allow Jesus to assume the throne by a woman, Mary, rather than through a man. You know, most genealogies, you know, they don't, Go through the woman, you know, they go through the man, you know, in Scripture. Now, I do believe that most likely that Healy was the, da the dad of Mary, and that, as I said, Joseph was the adoptive son of Healy, who probably had no daughters, and, and by adopting Joseph, he could pass along the line of David by Nathan, as well as Joseph's own line by Solomon. So, in other words, to get around by the curse, then... He, uh, you know, Jesus was a blood relative descendant from David directly through Mary, through Nathan. And then her dad, Healy, would adopt, you know, basically, you know, it'd be like, a, you know, he took him as his own son, Joseph, so that all, you know, all the, everything would pass through Joseph since, you know, he only had daughters more than likely. And then... You know, Joseph, through his own line, you know, would have the king. So, you know, between the two of them, you know, then Jesus would have that authority to have that, you know, to, to rule as king. Uh, let me see here. Now, Joseph would have been the son-in-law of Healy, but he is referred to as son since this was how they, they believed, unlike the way we do today. You know, they didn't necessarily think of somebody, well, he's my son-in-law. You know, they would think of him as if he was just as much a real son as, as you know, a biological son. Especially in this case here where he it believed he did not have any sons. So, you know, he would. it was definitely important that, you know, they wanted to have that son. You know, also there was no specific word in Greek for son-in-law, unlike in Hebrew. So son would be used. Now, there is, the word son-in-law is used in the Old Testament because there was a Hebrew word for that, but there was no specific, specific word in Greek for son and law, so they would just say son, because again, that was their thinking anyway, so, you know, we try to separate everything in, in our day, but that's not how they, they, they thought. Now, Zeliphad's daughters were required to marry 
within the tribe so that the land stayed in the tribe, and the same still applies here, which it did. Mary and Joseph were both of the tribe of Judah, so Mary obeyed by marrying within her tribe. Some try to say Mary was a Levite since her cousin Elizabeth was a Levite, but that is not true. You know, we're going to look at this here in a minute. Turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. But Mary obeyed the, the Liverite law by marrying within her tribe. You know, she was a, through the, uh, tribe, with the tribe of Judah, through the, uh, Nathan, the son of David, and Joseph was the tribe of Judah through the son of David by Solomon. So, you know, she stayed within her tribe. Now look at Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Luke chapter 1 and verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So we see that Elizabeth was clearly you know, from the tribe of Levi. Now most likely Mary's dad, Healy, married a Levite who was the sister of either the mom or dad of Elizabeth, and thus Elizabeth was her cousin, but they were from different tribes. You know, so it's easy to explain why her cousin could be a Levite and she could be, you know, from the tribe of Judah. It doesn't mean just because her cousin was a Levite that automatically she was a Levite, because she was not. It clearly shows, you know, in the, the line here that she was from the tribe of Judah. Now, those who claim that Mary was a Levite say this shows how Jesus is entitled to be both king by Joseph and priest by Mary. But Jesus gets his priesthood by God, not Mary. You know, because, you know, as a, as a, Jesus is clearly from the tribe of Judah. You know, the scripture clearly tells us that. So, you know, he's getting the priesthood. You know, the, the tribe of Judah was not the priest. He's getting his priesthood not from any, you know, his mom or dad, he gets it from God himself. You know, that you can read about that in Hebrews. That, that's the whole point of talking about, you know, his, his priesthood is superior, you know, as Melchizedek and so forth. You know, his priesthood is far superior than that of, of Aaron's. Now, as I said earlier, it was very unusual for the genealogy to be traced by the mom rather than the dad. But then again, Jesus was not your ordinary son and had been born of a virgin. Now, people often claim the Bible is sexist against women as it is a patriarchal society, yet Christianity gives more opportunities to females than any other religion. And here we see how the important genealogy of Jesus to prove he has a right as the Messiah to the throne of David comes from a female and not a man. So this claim is false. You know, again, all these women are always trying to claim all these things, but that's simply not true. You know, if they would read scripture, they would see that Christianity offers more opportunities for women than anything else. You know, go try becoming a Muslim or something, and you'll see what kind of freedom you have. You know, become a Buddhist or a Hindu or something. And, and we see here the importance of it comes through the line of Mary, you know, his mom, that he has this right. I think, as I said, that's why they have that whole uh, thing about Sahelophad's daughters. You know, Jesus will one day soon rule, and it will be by his blood, <clears throat> excuse me, his bloodline through his mom, and not by a man. The fact that God allows the Heliphaz's daughters the right of inheritance and later continue on to other women, including Mary, shows God's grace and love for women as much as men. <clears throat> you know, so, you know, we see, like I said, that it is, I believe that, that Healy was the dad of Mary, and so forth, and so you know, but I think it is probably possible, you know, it's probably most likely that Healy did basically adopt uh, Joseph as like his legal son in that sense too, just like Jesus, I mean, Joseph adopted Jesus. So, you know, but it, we see that through those two cases there, that out of those two genealogies, they're both important, that you couldn't just have the one, in my opinion, that, you know, Mary's had to be in there as well, because otherwise Jesus would have been disqualified from, you know, being king. But, you know, we clearly see that he is son of David and has the right to, to be a king. Now, a third genealogy of Jesus is found in John. Most people miss this genealogy. The two genealogies in Matthew and Luke are relevant to Christmas as they show the birth of Jesus as a man and his earthly connection to man as a man. 
Now this shows Jesus was a man just like any man today and he had descendants and ancestry just like us. Jesus could clearly trace his ancestry back to David and beyond, and, you know, back to Abraham and so forth. And he had every right to claim to be the Messiah and he will have every right to reign as king one day soon. But I said, most people do not recognize this third genealogy. But John does not show the genealogy of Jesus as a man, but rather as God. Now, unlike the Matthew and Luke genealogies, which show a beginning for Jesus as a man, John shows that as God, Jesus has always existed. So John's not showing the creation of Jesus as God. It's showing him that as God, he has always existed. You know, so there's the difference there. You know, it's not like Jehovah's Witnesses or and others to say that Jesus was created. It's John's showing you that as the genealogy as God, he has always existed. <clears throat> but you know, not only is, is, is God as he always existed, but that he created everything else. Look at John chapter one, verses one through three. So John chapter one, verses one through three. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. <clears throat> the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now it is important to include this genealogy as Jesus was not a mere man when He was here on earth, but rather was the God-man who became a 100% man just like any man, yet He still retained His 100% being God. Look at John chapter 1, again on verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then turn to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. So turn to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. So we see that, you know, this genealogy, in my opinion, has to be included because it shows that He was still 100% God but yet he was also 100% man, as we saw in the Matthew and Luke genealogies. Remember, John is all about showing that Jesus is God. So Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You know, if you read on, it's showing you that, that Jesus, he had the full Godhead bodily within him. You know, he never lost his being God. He was still fully 100% God. He was just as much a part of the Godhead as he was also 100% man at the same time. Now it is by the fact that Jesus as God was willing to become a man and die for our sins and rise again from the grave on that third day that we are able to be reconciled with God. You know, if he was not the God man, we never we would still be dead in our sins. In closing, there are two genealogies listed for Jesus as a man to clearly show that Jesus is the son of David, which is never disputed, and he does have the legal right to reign as king. This, will all, this was also never disputed. I showed you where people never said that he was not the son of David or he had, did not have the right to the throne. Those things were never disputed even by his enemies. But we also see a third genealogy in John showing how Jesus has always been God and only became a man when he was born in a vir virgin birth by Mary. As we will soon celebrate Christmas, remember how Jesus will one day reign as king, and remember his genealogical record bears proof that he is the Messiah and son of David. Remember that there are no contradictions or errors found in the King James Bible, and we see again this is true with two completely different genealogies of the same person. You know, they're, they're two different lines. If you were to take the names, you know, from that point on, there's all these different names, but yet they're clearly the same person, you know, and there's no, there's no errors. Now, all things are in Scripture for a reason, even the seemingly unimportant things such as Sahelophad's daughters. This also shows how all Scripture is about Jesus. You know, they always say, you know, every verse points to Jesus. Well, I don't know if, you know, necessarily literally every verse, but, you know, the point is that, it's all there to basically to get you to Jesus. That, you know, these things that we think of, like, why does God just randomly put in this thing about Sahelophad's daughters? Or why do they put in some random, what seems to be a random little thought that just kind of blurps in there a little thing, like, like who cares? So his daughter's got some land or whatever. But it's because of that little so-called loophole that 
Jesus was able to retain that throne of David and you know as be able to rule you know one day as king. You know, so all things are in scripture for a reason. They're just not randomly just thrown in there by some writer or something like that. And they're all there to ultimately get us back to Jesus because those things were in there so that Jesus could, you know, they could point to Jesus later on to show his genealogy. But we need to just study scripture and learn from it so that we may understand the coming future events. Praise God that he allowed Zehelophad's daughters the right to an inheritance so that Jesus was allowed his rightful inheritance because of this law by his mom Mary. God truly is a righteous and loving God. So, you know, if you look at these genealogies, we see that, that um, you know, Jesus clearly has the right to the throne of David and, and so forth. And, you know, they're all there for a reason. And like I said, there's not this, none of this stuff just randomly put in there. You know, Joseph, you know, uh, Matthew's genealogy just goes back to Abraham because of the Jews. They were looking for that king, and in their mind, you know, their nation, you know, goes back to Abraham. That's all they care about. Luke shows Jesus as a man, you know, the, the son of man. So, you know, his genealogy goes actually all the way back to Adam, which actually goes back to God. You know, he's the son. Adam was the son of God. So we see the two differences in the genealogies in, in the sense that you know they're there for to show us these things. But let's. Uh, Thank God that these things were in there and we can we can learn from them. But I pray that if there's somebody listening that's not saved, that today might be the day they turn to Jesus so that they too may be able to serve Jesus during the millennium when he, he rules and reigns as king and the son of David. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day you've given us here. and We thank you for this time to study on the genealogies of Jesus. That again, it's one of those things that People kind of skim over them. They might mention, well, why is there two different genealogies? Is that? But nobody, most pastors do not get too involved in it and, and uh, don't really think of the significance of it in relation to Christmas. And so, Father, we just thank you for pointing these things out and, and that you did have the ex exception there for Zehelophad's daughter. So, that, you know, now that, that, that you show that that you treat women and men, you know, you, you love them both, unlike what many people say, but yet you also allow ways that, that uh, Jesus could still re remain and, and have the right to the throne of David. And so, Father, we just pray that you bless this day, bless the upcoming service, and just be with each and every one. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.